Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Adam Hall. Adam has 27 years of experience in acquiring, developing, and redeveloping real estate and raising uh, over a billion dollars in equity and debt funding from all kinds of sources. Um, Adam had a kind of midlife crisis and shift, and today he is one of the leading partners in something called the Earth Keepers Alliance. We're going to find out just what that is. Um, and he came to my attention because he wrote a wonderful book called The Earth Keeper, Undeveloping the Future. We're going to find out all about it right now. Welcome, Adam Hall. I'm so delighted you could join us. Well, it's great to be here with you, Miriam, and great to be here with uh, all of your audience and look forward to sharing today and and touching basis on uh, a few things that are very relevant and important uh, as it relates to our planet and our own individual lives today. So it's, let's do it. Well, speaking of individual lives, you have certainly been through the mill. Um, tell us, set the scene for us about what your life was like as you were living the American dream. Well, it it was the American dream of I, I married my junior high school and high school sweetheart. Uh, we have three amazing and gorgeous uh, uh, daughters. I'm also a grandfather twice over now, and uh, but we built the big house, uh, the the successful real estate business, and you know the cars, the club, the clothes, you know all those great accoutrements. And when I reached the what I sensed was a pinnacle, so to speak, a really high point uh, in in of that dream, I realized that something dearly and vital was missing, Marion, and um, I was unhappy, and I needed to go find out just what was causing that unhappiness and what was missing. So that's that was the beginning of the quest that I took to find out some of life's most important questions. Just who am I and why am I here and what are the gifts that I have to share and how can I bring that forth in the fullest way to support a better and more prosperous planet that we all share together. So that was the, the beginning of it all. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people on this planet are, are leading what uh, has famously been called lives of quiet desperation. Um, what do you think it was in your character that made you decide rather than <clears throat> drowning yourself in, in, you know, alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever, to actually go on retreat and take up yoga and meditation for heaven's sakes? <laughs> well, it, it, it's it's a very good question because the life that I was living, I refer to it as Adam One O, <laughs> was a life of of what um, it was a kind of a life what some would say is a life of the, the a dominator mentality, a con a conquistador type of mentality. And um, I'll never forget when I was in my formidable uh, years of my career in real estate, just getting going. I, one of the great prolific leaders in our industry, shared that uh, we need to live by the law of the jungle. Hmm. And the law of the jungle goes when the sun comes up in the morning, whether you're a lion or a gazelle, you better run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Eat or be eaten. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the uh, I took that uh, in, in literally. And uh, that's how I operated from that place in the flaw, the character flaw, so to speak, that you pointed out. It was pretty straightforward. I was really, in a set, living a life that was very narcissistic and the universe surrounded who I was and what I was doing. And that is just the 
the bold, uh, honest fact of the matter, and that <laughs> I needed to recognize that, and mm. I needed to change that, and then that's what really set me off in earnest to discover uh, and to uh, share the ultimate uh, uh, true nature of our being, and that's what I'm doing as we speak. I am still in the process of evolving and and hopefully will be for many, many more years until my last breath. So it's it's an evolution, but it's a conscious evolution now. It's one where I have a greater capacity to do things that are more purposeful and to also have course corrections where I need to immediately instead of driving over the cliff, so to speak. So it's it's been a, it's been a good ride and the and the law of the jungle is no longer the law that i live by you had quite a lot of resistance within your own family and within your own <clears throat> circle of acquaintances um what do you think it was in in your heart or in your makeup that made you persevere in the face of what was really pretty fierce resistance well, it's it's um, and and that is is a deep one because ultimately I had no relationship with spirit. I had little or no relationship with God, although I was brought up in the Pro- Protestant Church, but hadn't gone for years. Um, I wasn't really into New Age woo woo type of stuff. And so I was a, more of a skeptic uh, uh, or a non-believer. And ultimately, when I reached a point uh, which I would say was the depths of uh, what some refer to as the dark night of the soul, I had nowhere to turn. And I, I, asked, I asked God to help me. And the next day, I heard a voice a loving, soft, feminine voice uh, that I share deeply and intimately in the book. Uh, as I was sitting on the beach, the voice came and she said, Adam, uh, I'm here with you now. I've always been with you. I'm here to help show you the way into your being. Just listen. Listen to me. And that's what I begin to do. And I slowly but surely be, had be, had faith and trust that the universe was holding me to heal my life, to find the wholeness, the holiness of, of my being and my beingness. And so I followed that instinct and trusted that instinct. And I do so today, even as things can be complicated or conflicting or uh, challenging because certainly life you know, on earth is for all of us and it is that way for me. So hopefully that helps to give you some, 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 some insight into what that is. Well, I'm not going to let you get away with that, Adam. It took you 200 <laughs> pages in the book <laughs> to get to that point of certainty. <laughs> nice try. Um, so you essentially embarked on what I would call the shamanic path. What were the the sort of milestones on that path that started building this sense of certainty? Because I have interviewed many, many people and read even more books on this subject of people who have had either a mystical experience or the dark night of, of the soul or revelation or all of the above. And one of the biggest challenges, the hurdles that they have to overcome is trusting. It takes a long time to get past your own, um, you know, sense of re- what is real to open up to the possibility that there is something beyond our senses that is just as real as what we can see, feel, touch, or measure. So tell us some of the the, the kind of highlights on your path that really moved you forward. 
Sure. And I, I want to just give a little backdrop to the path that I chose, the, the more uh, indigenous path. And uh, having read extensively uh, in, in search of answers, uh, I am a deep student, a long student of the Course of Miracles and remain that way today. But ultimately, uh, Miriam, all the therapy and the books and some of the teachers that were coming along as I was in that uh, search for which way to go, whether those were Eastern modalities of uh, Buddhism and Taoism or more traditional Western modalities, which I was less inclined to investigate other than Gnostic Christianity and some of the old pagan traditions. I resonated uh, deeply uh, with the indigenous traditions, uh, the Native American traditions, the Mayan and Central American traditions, as well as South American modality, uh, which are aligned with the Incan traditions. Um, so to, to, in doing that and choosing that path, I, what I found was a deep resonance uh, with earth, with nature, and hence that's why much of my work today is aligned purely with uh, Mother, Mother Nature and Mother Earth. And, uh, but ultimately, when I stepped onto this shamanic path, what I found was that it was a direct uh, experience uh, with what I, was fe I feared. Uh, for hmm. example, I, when I began to explore my own fears of being outdoors in the darkness in the middle of the wilderness, Instead of uh, just seeing that, I actually went into the wilderness. Uh, for example, I share a story in the book about night walking in Zion Park uh, and walking out into the wilderness in the middle of the night and experiencing my own fear, literally the sweat on my palm and, the, and just tapping into the breath that I was feeling. So there were moments that I challenged and looked at my own fears. And yet there were other moments that were more uh, inclined to say, just trust with what you are feeling. And I share one of the vision quests that I went on in, on to the Hopi and the Navajo Nation. I share a story about riding a, a Mustang. Uh, that the, the <laughs> that was the, a fantastic story. The that the Native Americans had caught up on the on the on their on their nation. And I had last I had ridden a, a, a horse was when I was a small kid at my fifth birthday party, <laughs> but I rode the horse because it, I felt called to do something that just spoke to me to, to, to go to the edge, to go to, to push myself into places that I had not been. And, you know, those are physical experiences that I, those are just two examples. And there are many more that I share in the book, certainly when I traveled into the jungles of South America. But those are real physical observations of my, what I was perceiving. But really, when I got into the deeper inner world, uh, within my own psyche, within my own nature, my own kind of psycho-spiritual nature, as some would say, those were the places that was really uncharted territory. And uh, and that really took place when I got deeper into the jungles of Peru and also into the high mountains at 15,000 feet in the Andean Mountains. And I could talk uh, on and on about this, and I don't want to belabor all of it, but it's the key here was to incrementally step through my own fear and my own personal mythology and to, to redefine and to heal and to forgive and to surrender and allow 
what was com- coming forth from my own soul's ge- yearning to allow it to come forth and to bear witness to its birth and to graciously let what needed to die away to die away to make room for what I now refer to as Adam 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that's what many people call doing the work. Um, And however much you would like to have instant enlightenment, it doesn't usually happen that way. It seems to be a process of peeling off the layers of the onion bit by bit and getting down to um, facing, acknowledging all of the fears and uh, troubles that have been planted in our psyche throughout our lifetime and before. Mm -hmm. And as you say, acknowledging, releasing, forgiving, that seems to be one of the biggest ones, forgiving yourself and forgiving the others. Yes, and you're right. You're right on with that. That is spot on because ultimately there is no other path other than to face those fears and to heal those wounds. And some may say you can circumvent that or you can trick yourself into thinking you don't need to go there or do that. And a lot of those, a lot of those things, we don't even know what's there. And the course really speaks to this beautifully because it speaks about fear in relationship to the unknown. And it says very clearly that it's not the unknown that we fear. It's the idea that it's unknown that we fear. And ultimately what I found was when I worked through the fear to get into what was unknown, when I got to what was unknown was really where the gems are. And there was nothing to fear. And as a matter of fact, that's where the game really changed for me. And uh, But everybody has their process, but much of the traditions, and if not all of the traditions that I've studied, there is just no two ways around what some would say walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, we must walk through that and perhaps many times, but ultimately knowing we are love, we are loved, all is forgiven, and that our greatest truth now blossoms into our life so that we can fulfill our dreams and our heart's truest desires. And that's, that, would, that was really what kept me going through all of these challenging and difficult moments that occurred ultimately to relish the treasures that are found. And of course, I'm in the process of doing that every day in my life. It makes it so worthwhile. Yes. Yes. Um, you, you were not really a particularly nice fellow, um, earlier on. Um, what do you think was the, the kind of core shift um, in in your approach to other people that opened you up to what I would call compassion. Well, that and you're right about that. I I share very clearly that uh, that I wasn't a nice fellow, as you would say, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it, if I was to look at it, kind of. Um, in the rear view mirror or looking forward or looking at it, what's happening in the world in general, I was really a representation of the masculine gone awry uh, or the masculine gone wild. And it created a sense of, of hard driving, hard charging shortness um, and disrespectful, perhaps some would say, um, others would say other things, but I would readily address that as a shortcoming that I uh, had. And it, it wasn't so much of uh, a, a moment or time. It was so. Mu- it was really more about ending the story that I was living in of separation and allowing that 
to fall away. And I refer to that as undevelopment and stepping into the natural state that I believe all of us uh, hold as our indelible truths. And in that moment of nurturing that and allowing that to have be given presence and to to allow that to be birthed into my life then i begin to awaken to com- compassion and kindness in a life of service and i must say i could not have done it without uh the divinity of the feminine I could not have done it without that. And that divinity came through nature, uh, Mother Earth, through uh, an angel that is in my book and that's also in my life, Lizanne, um, a beautiful feminine goddess. And I must say, I give a lot of credit to that that divine aspect of that the world it's available to all of us <laughs> and uh, and to men i address that specifically and to integrate that fully into the masculine and so in when that occurred that's when the shift uh um moved uh clearly in the direction of of the service and the con- compassion and kindness and forgiveness of of, of being so that's uh that touch that, that should touch a little bit upon upon what your question is you said the magic words i'm happy um you developed uh a, a f- very deep friendship and relationship with alberto violdo um who actually even wrote the forward to your book um, what was this kind of seminal experience that he took you through that opened up your vision for what you are to do, what you were to do now? Well, big, big, big question. And uh, ultimately, uh, Dr. Vialdo, uh, who is a medical anthropologist, uh, a master uh, shaman, uh, a prolific writer and speaker and teacher, and um, a light in the world. And in the process of of engaging with him personally, primarily, personally, it was to um, ultimately do what um, I would describe as an attunement to attune the resonance of my soul and my spirit, uh, and that w- the vibrational energy of my own being with that of the earth and that of the universe. And so there's a lot of processes and practices, rites, initiations that go into all of that. And I share many of them in the book. But the seminal experience, as you put forth, is the experience that is results as to integrating uh, my old doing sense of self, the separate self, into the being the into the whole self, the holiness of myself as a universal human. Mm-hmm. Um, so that uh, attunement and that integration or that union, what the Incans refer to as Aini, Aini, being in Aini, was the core of what Dr. Vialdo is sharing with the world uh, as we speak. <laughs> and um, so many things occur in between, but the essence, the quintessence is to be in the deeper resonance with my spirit, my soul, and my connection of heaven and earth as a, as a God being. 
Now, one of the attunements that you got was as um, an earth keeper, which seems to have really resonated with your the very core of your being. Um, tell us where you've taken that. Well, an, an earth keeper, for those of you that are not familiar with the term, it's an indigenous term, and it's put forth by... Uh, the elders that uh, give rites and initiations to uh, to become an earth keeper, and an earth keeper is one that tends to the living universe. It attends to everything from a, a pebble to the trees to the garden to community to uh, to all of the betterment the into the wellness and vitality of the living universe and so it's a great responsibility and duty and i um received that right in peru in 2006 uh on at 15,000 feet uh in a holy mountain and uh i didn't take it lightly and so what I have uh, in, been doing, Miriam, is I've been integrating my, uh, my practice, my, my own personal spiritual practice uh, into the life that I'm living and what I am doing before what I was doing and what I was being was, were two different things. So today... Life is integral in the context that it is what I am doing and what I am being is one and the same. So I took my real estate career, and this is important for everybody to know. You don't necessarily, and you, you don't have to at all, junk your entire life because you choose to show up for the life that you were meant to live. And I asked many questions of myself and ultimately I decided the best way that I could serve is to share these conversations uh, with others, hence the book, hence speaking today, and but also to really show up in the area of land and land and in land conserver, conservation, preservation of land and to as an undevelopment of developer of land. And so that's where we're engaging today. It's a new model. It's it's exciting and it's it's it has tremendous challenge because old systems are still very much in place. But I am embracing what is new and what is uh, the possibilities around a life and a planet that serves all, not just a few. I think this is sort of part of the movement uh, called conscious capitalism. Um, tell us what the principles behind undevelopment are. Well, you're it, it, exactly. It is conscious cap capitalism instead of predatory capitalism, and thankfully, just in the nick of time. So ultimately, the the principles around uh, conscious capitalism and the principles around new models, new financial models that we hear are hearing more and more about, green models, sustainable models, um, really surround what I refer to as the quadruple bottom line. And that puts forth the proposition that we engage in the world uh, and we are doing things in the world of commerce, finance, whatever we are doing, that we look at it from the context of not just surely driving a bottom line of profits, but we look at it always from looking at the quadruple bottom line of people, planet, profits with purpose, P to the power of four. And if you notice, profits is in there. And no one part of those four items is more significant than the other. 
and they are not mutually exclusive, which is a great myth that you can't tend to people in the environment because you'll give up your profits. That is just simply not the case. And as a matter of fact, if you're just tending to your profits, you're actually in a place of degradating perhaps the environment degradating communities and you have no in the purpose is lost and we've seen that uh over the last 150 years uh of of the in the industrial age and we are now beginning to recognize the effects of that and uh and i think we're just beginning to see the effects of that because uh my assessment is is we haven't seen nothing yet. And our relationship to this quadruple bottom line is the imperative of our time. And that it's there is a level of urgency for each of us because each and every one of you makes a difference and uh, to really show up. So that's what I'm uh, doing in, in my little way, in my, the world that I'm, I'm living and sharing. Now, in the world of business, which you have been steeped in for all of your working life, um, profits, as you alluded, seem to be the, the, the one and only goal. I mean, the uh, uh, common wisdom is that the essential duty of a corporation is to maximize profits for its investors. Um and what you're saying is that there are other considerations that should be factored into the notion of profits. So it's not just monetary profits, but also um, the the relationship of the company to the community, the service element. Um, do you see this idea as growing in acceptability to the business community, do you you have pulled together an interesting team into the Earthkeepers Alliance, which I will ask you about shortly. Um, do you think more and more people are open to reducing their financial profits um, in favor of the greater good? I do, and I'm very pleased to. Uh, uh, be part of that in uh, at the Earthkeeper Alliance, but I am witnessing that there are industries that are leading the way with that. Uh, one of them is uh, Whole Foods, for example, uh, is doing a, a, an excellent job at uh, executing upon the quadruple bottom line. Um, certainly, we all can do better. Uh, but there are other firms, uh, Patagonia, a great clothing maker, a, a great leader in e- ecology and the environment, Yvonne Chouinard, uh, has been a longtime leader in this space. Um, we, it's becoming more pervasive in uh, co- uh, the C-suite in general. The, that's the executive suites that run corporations. And uh, my sense is any corporation – that is strictly focused on the, that singular bottom line is a corporation that is in a, a state of demise. And that demise may be slow and incremental, but it will certainly be very prolific uh, as we move forward unless other considerations are taking, taking in, taken into consideration. So my sense is is that this quote unquote conscious capitalism uh, that advocates a greater bottom line, it is uh, growing. It's growing uh, rapidly, as a matter of fact, not just incrementally. It's now actually geometrically expanding, and we will see a lot more of it. And it may not be to the extent that we hope for, but ultimately it is a, a movement in the right direction and just in the nick of time because ultimately what I sense is that old models are breaking down into new models and you get to choose or each of us gets to choose which which part 
of this world do you want to live and be in and create in and collaborate in as a as a co-creator or just stay in the old system that is uh now in its own state of uh of its own state of uh, collapse I, as i see it well there is a great metaphysical principle as above so below or in this case as below so above um i'm i'm kind of thinking of this trajectory that your life took of rising through the the red in tooth and fang mentality to the pinnacle of success um by you know sort of uh, old standards of uh, american capitalism and being sick in your spirit and what we're seeing i think now with the um you know citizens united the the corporations with um the legislators in their pockets and giving no um concern or no thought to the impact on the planet i think that that is they they're also feeling this kind of internal illness part of which i must say is driven by the fact that people are voting with their dollars and and going for organic and natural products but i i am hopeful that this is a sea change in the boardrooms uh as well um tell us what impact investing is because that's something that you prop- pose and promote as well well impact investing is uh, a very growing space um i wouldn't define it as an asset class like a stock or a bond or a commodity or real estate it's 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 a it's an investing strategy that says i want to uh, as say for example if you were an investor you, you say i want to invest in a company that is supporting um small businesses that are creating jobs in inner cities or supporting financing startup uh businesses in india or africa or china it's really about putting your money where your your heart is and y- it may result in a lesser financial reward but it also results in a deep more what i refer to as a spiritual reward or spiritual wealth and so it brings a greater uh sense of of wholeness to your life and that's what impact investing is mm-hmm. traditionally we think of philanthropic inve- or nonprofit or charitable and thing that's one thing this is also uh this is uh, more of a hybrid of just purely giving your money away versus purely just trying to invest capital for the greatest profit and it's 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 very purposeful and it's a growing space and i'm and i i want to also share with you on your uh very um your comments that are very astute and uh, about obser- observing mary and what is happening in boardrooms and um i was at a luncheon not too long ago very much geared towards uh investing in traditional old uh traditional ways and i happened to be sitting next to a an elderly man a a uh, a billionaire uh a fairly well known one uh, one of the brightest people uh, on the planet uh, i say that quote unquote bright and uh i asked him i said well t- well tell me what is your feeling about what's going on out there every the markets are high and you know we're making all this money and all these things are are going on and what is your sense of it all and he looked me in the eye and he says i'm not very comfortable with it and in all my years i've never been as concerned and as uncomfortable as i am today and 
this wasn't it wasn't about what is happening out in the markets about what he's feeling within his own life is what he's really sharing mm-hmm. and that that uncomfortableness is is what essentially is the shift and the energy that is really shifting on the planet that has shifted and is shifting and is moving quite with quite a velocity and the higher vibrational flow of things necessitates that each of us tune into what that means for each of us. And that's what he was expressing. So my sense is, yes, there is a great shift uh, across the board. It's universal. And will it get to the boardrooms? It's in the boardrooms. Will those in the boardrooms recognize it and discuss it? Well, I certainly hope so. I think it's happening. I think it's incumbent upon the uh, f- women leaders, women executives to give voice to this and to really lead this conversation uh, because the old structure, the old guard, the old peri- per- patriarchal structure is less re- available to do it. That's not to say they won't. That's just say to say they're less available and they need a little hand holding. So, so all you uh, wonderful uh, women leaders out there, <laughs> uh, we're available. Take our hand a little bit. We need some help here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your big sewer ranch project. Oh my gosh! And and what's neat about the the big sewer story really is. The uh, what I I sense is alive in all our lives today, Marion, and that is the availability to live synchronistically, the availability to, to have significant life changing moments and meetings that are synergistic, that actually in when we come together in a symbiotic way. A way that is like uh, if I was living my narcissistic life, you know, wouldn't be wouldn't be available for the the potential uh, potentiality of of being, living synergistically. But in symbiosis, where we live in concert with with one another and recognize that we all we all work together as a whole system, not as a part of the system, not in separation. But when we recognize that. Uh, significant things can happen. And the root of the Earth Keeper Alliance was birthed when I came to the Big Sur Ranch, which is a 400 acre ranch. It stre- line, stretches a million, excuse me, a mile and a half of, of oceanfront, magnificent uh, land. And begin to steward that and learn about stewardship and learn about easements and conserving the land and learn about the depths of my own earth and who I am and my own ecology and my relationship to the planet. So Big Sur was a um, a, a seminal moment, as you pointed asked earlier. It was a seminal moment in my coming out, and it was a gift from the universe uh as a result of showing up and uh, and I continue to show up and I continue to work and grow and and uh, work with my own stories in my own life but ultimately to to do that and that's kind of what leads to significant uh sim- symbiosis with land and symbioticness with uh the others that it will occur for each of you should you choose to show up. And that's what Big Sur was for me. So the the principle behind it was that you take this large acre of land and rather than divide it up into as many um, possible plots and squeeze the last drop of profit that you can out of it, you actually conserve the vast majority of the land and develop it um, uh, sympathetic with nature. Yes, and, and that, it, it, is it still off the grid? It 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 is off the grid, and uh, it it really is about the taking a, what I refer to as undevelopment, 
Of course, that relates to my own personal journey undeveloping myself, but it also relates to my thought and my process and uh, the mission of the Earth Keeper Alliance is to really reduce entitlement and development rights, re- to reduce them through conservation, through pr- preservation and and uh, protection of both fauna and flora and the the life that lives on a piece of land, but to keep enough where it be, can still maintain an economically it can be economically viable. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what we're out doing. We're talking to large land developers to to bring this message uh, to their uh, space. We're talking to investors in this space we're doing things uh with a project in hawaii and we're doing something now in california again so we're rolling this out and uh, having some fun with it are you finding uh developers resonating with this idea yes and no um the um yes from the standpoint of um I am in conversations to, uh, every day virtually with others, developers that are interested in the model and interested in, in, in implementing um, what we're talking about. Uh, others um, uh, are riding high again um, and have kind of found themselves in a drunken state because the market came, has come back from a very mm-hmm. sear serious depression real estate did go into that place in 07 and 08 and is riding high again so which of course that in its own right makes my business challenging but ultimately uh i am finding an audience i'm finding developers saying i'm i too am an undeveloper so it's it's kind of neat and uh it's it's expanding and and so i i have a lot of hope for this conversation and this execution of our, our business plan and our mission as we go forward. Well, I can only hope that your model uh, really ignites a wave because too many people tend to uh, drive like, looking in the rearview mirror, looking at the past, expecting that the past will come back, the old days will come back, and the old profits. And they're not looking at what our impact is on the future. I I think this global climate change that we're experiencing now is waking up a lot of people and they're seeing that profits are not the be all and the end all, that we are having a negative impact on the, on the planet. And we have to change our ways if we are not going to be courting disaster. So, Adam Hall, I'm I'm really so pleased that you have uh, made this uh, really fundamental shift and and have been so candid in your book telling the whole trajectory of your awakening. And I want to commend this book um to the reader because it it really is a book for our time. So, Thank you. Do you you have a last message for our listeners? Well, thank you, Miriam, and thank you all for listening today. And uh, we do and are living in a very exciting time, and it holds uh, so much hope for each of us. And it's uh, and each and every one of us really matters. And I look forward to connecting uh, again uh, with you, Marion, and look forward to saying hello to all of your audience as we go forward to a, a new world where we are living in a place that is really honors the planet and it honors people and it brings together our community in the, in the way that we can collaborate and co-create together. So blessings and love to, to everyone and, uh, have a wonderful day. And what is your website, Adam? You can find the Earthkeeper Alliance at uh, earth the earthkeeperalliance.com, earthkeeperalliance.com, and I encourage everybody to check out earthkeepermovement.com. 
earthkeepermovement.org, earthkeepermovement.org. We send out a monthly newsletter. You can put your name in there, and we, we only send it out once a month. So check that out, and um, I hope you, hope you enjoy it. Adam Hall, author of The Earthkeeper, Undeveloping the Future. Thank you so much for being with us. You can find Adam's book on our website, ncreview.com, along with lots of other goodies. And now we're going to close with our track of the week called Angelic Healing by Alea Dow. Angelic Healing from the album Light Body Sound Healing by Alea Dow. Alea is a sound healer, musician, energy practitioner, and acupuncturist who holds a master's degree in oriental medicine. She works and lives in California and offers teaching and sound healing sessions there. 
Her popular daily guided cups of consciousness meditations are enjoyed by subscribers from all over the world. You can find out more on her website, aleadao.com. That's A L E Y A D A O.com. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.